Welcome to you all. Thank you for coming to this session and those uh, watching virtually. Um, it's only a 20 minute session, so we don't have much time for questions. So I will try and take questions at the end if that's okay. Uh, anyone who's watching remotely, then type your questions into the Canopy app. I'll see them here and I'll try and get to those um, if we have time afterwards as well. Um, any questions that we don't have time for, then come and see me. I'll be on either the Sentinel stand or on the information desk um, for the whole time. So come and see me or my colleagues. Right, so, uh, yeah, a bit about me before we start. My name's Alex Whittles. I'm on the SQL Bits Organizing Committee. So on behalf of the committee, thank you for coming this week. Great to see you all here. I uh, hope you're having an amazing week. Um, I'm uh, a data platform MVP, have been for eight years, I think, something like that. Uh, I run Purple Frog, which is a data analytics consultancy, doing data warehousing, cubes, ETL, Power BI, machine learning, anything like that you need. And I also run Power BI Sentinel which is a software as a service uh, data governance, auditing, and disaster recovery tool for Power BI. Um, so this is a sponsored session. We, I will touch on how Sentinel can help with things, but the main focus is on the planning of your estate and what you need to do. So I will show you where Sentinel can help, but you don't need Sentinel to get something out of this session. Hopefully that makes sense. If you want to know any more detail, or you want more details about Sentinel, then we've got a booth over that way. Come and have a, have a chat to me and the team. We'll be delighted to give you a demo and talk about it. Right, so um, I've talked about that. I'll skip over that. So what are we talking about? Power BI uh, governance. Why is governance important? You need to build trust in any data environment, in any IT environment. If your users don't have trust, they're not going to use and adopt it. You can put as much time and effort as you want into building any platform. And if it's not reliable, if it's not consistent and trustworthy, people are not going to use it. So it's all, with any self-service reporting tool, it's very easy to get going, especially with Power BI, and end up with hundreds or thousands of users creating reports everywhere. And how do you know what they're doing is actually good and right if you don't monitor it? Um, it's vital that the data is consistent. You can't be having 10 reports that show different data. Now, you've got lots of different report devs all around the business. How do you make sure you monitor what they're doing? Monitoring things like that is vital to gain confidence in the platform. Availability. I, not only does Power BI work, but have, are the data sets refreshing? Has it got current data in? How are you monitoring that? How do you look after that? How do you make sure that the experience your user's getting is giving them accurate business data, current live business data, to make appropriate decisions? <coughs> Transparency. Who can access what? How do you know who's doing what in your environment? You're creating all these reports. How do you know who's got permissions to things? How do you know who's got access to things? How do you know what's happening in there? When you get asked as the Power BI experts in your business, what is happening inside Power BI, what answer do you give? It's up to you to be your own hero in the company and make sure that you can give the answers to these questions. And all of these tie into regulatory requirements. Whether it's GDPR, whether it's Sarbanes-Oxley, whether it's um, industry-specific regulations, you need to know what's happening inside your Power BI environment. You need to know that you've got a good plan for security, that things are being restricted on a, on a lease permissions required basis. So you can give confidence to those that are uh, in charge of regulatory requirements that you are not exposing data unnecessarily. So how does that look in a Power BI world? There's three parts of this. One is your planning. You have to have a well-structured plan on how you're going to create and structure your Power BI environment. The key things there are how do you um, uh, promote content for consumption, how do you plan your workspaces, how do you plan your security. But it's no good having a plan unless you can monitor are people sticking to your plan. Are people actually following the guidance that you're putting in place for security? Or are they giving everybody access to everything? So you need to monitor it. You need to know are people following your guidelines. And when you find a problem, you've got to fix it. We can't help you fixing stuff, that's up to you. But the idea behind the monitoring is that you know what needs to be fixed. And that's where you come in. Your time shouldn't be spent trying to find a needle in a haystack. You need tools or a process that's going to give you information to know where to go to look for things. So what is our goal for an end game Power BI type, uh, type structure? For anyone that's played with uh, Power BI composite models, things like that, uh, I'm doing a talk on that tomorrow if you haven't played with that. Um, <clears throat> It allows us to have a multi-tiered Power BI 
environment in our, uh, in our estate. So if we look at a typical end game for a Power BI architecture, on the left-hand side, you've got your centralized Power BI competency center, your IT team, your data team, probably everybody here. Uh, that includes data warehouse, your data lake, delta lake, whatever you want to call it these days, wherever your central business data is, creating data sets that are going to be used, or cubes, that are going to be used across your entire business. The old school centralization of data. And once you've got these centralized data sets, anyone with Power BI access can then create new reports based off those data sets. They're sharing that same content. Don't give them access to the warehouse and get them to create their own data set again. Reuse that logic. Reuse the relationships, the DAX, row-level security in that centralized data set and get them just to write reports that use it. Therefore, when you want to make a change, you change it once in your data set, not in 50 data sets. But with this model, you can then use the um, composite models, or what Microsoft like to call uh, direct query over a Power BI data set and Azure Analysis Services. Great acronym, PBI, AAS, DQ, whatever it is. Um, that allows you to take an existing Power BI data set and say, right, it's great, but I want to add another data set to it and enhance it a little bit more. Well, you can do that now with composite models or DQ models over data sets, where you're bringing in the 10% of extra information into the data set, but reusing the 90% that's come centrally, rather than the old school method of having to literally create a complete new data set, bring in all your data again. Now, that improves the impact on your source data, because they're not having to be hit by 50 different data sets. But also gives teams or departmental uh, BI teams the ability to create their own data sets that are customized to them faster without having to go back to the central team to upgrade the, the main data sets. How long does it take to bring in a new data feed into a data warehouse or data, or data lake or delta lake? It's not a quick process. You have to go through the, the channels to get the central team to, to, uh, to do it. But with hybrid models and composite models, you can now say, yeah, I want to bring in the centralized data warehouse or data lake, but actually I've got these other sources as well that are provided centrally but don't have to be in your data warehouse. They can be elsewhere, in a, in a data lake or in data flows. And then your departmental teams can then use that to bring the two together to create the models they want to create. You're still governing the data centrally, but giving them the flexibility to, to enhance it. And then we take that another step further and go from departmental BI to personal self-service BI, where again, they're not reinventing the wheel every time. They are taking what's already been provided by their team or by the central team, and, okay, I've got a spreadsheet of forecast data. I want to just put it in a report. Well, they can layer that on top of the existing data sets that are already provided. Now, this approach to a three-layered hierarchy gives you centralized control of your core data, but also the flexibility for your individual people or departments to do their own thing and enhance what you've done, standing on the shoulders of everything that you, got, you, you people have done. So this gives us this eternal battle between centralization or flexibility and self-service, which has always been a constant struggle. We've heard about self-service for years. It's never really been a true thing. With Power BI, it now is, with these DQ models and all the flexibility you get. So we can say, okay, our core core data is kept central. Yes, it's a bit slower to change and evolve, but it doesn't change and evolve that frequently. The stuff that does change and evolve is more on the power user or the individual self-service side of things. And the hybrid of those worlds is now a real thing, and it is, it is good. Right, so with that, <clears throat> one of the things we need to think about with this models is where do we put our reports to govern the security and management of and the control of who can do what in these different layers. And that comes down to workspaces. Workspace planning is the thing that's most often overlooked in every Power BI environment. People jump in and just cr everyone creates their own free-for-all workspaces. And that is a recipe for disaster. Planning your workspaces is vital early on and manage making sure people adhere to that. Do you have one workspace to rule them all? Do you have one workspace per report, one workspace per team, one workspace per project? How do you go about managing that? And every environment I see is different. The thing to really focus on with workspaces is about um, security and distribution. Those are the two key things for any workspace. Who's going to have access to it and how are you going to give it to them? 
So I tend to think of a workspace as it's not really one workspace per department. You don't want the finance department having one workspace because you've got the CFO and an accounts clerk or a, or a uh, bookkeeper. They don't want to see the same data. There's a fundamental difference in security between those two roles. So you need to have a workspace per securable role or group of data you want to expose. So if you've just got uh, invoice reconciliation, bookkeeping reports, yes, that's the generic finance department's workspace. Another workspace for senior finance or director level finance, because they are fundamentally different security models. Once you work out what those security groups are going to be, it's essentially one workspace per security group. But you can also then have one workspace that actually combines multiple groups. Uh, and we'll get on to security in a minute. But when you plan it like that, it becomes easier to manage who has access. And you end up avoiding the scenario of, OK, well, everyone has access to that workspace because that's the way it is. People have access to too much data. That will destroy you for any kind of ISO or SOC 2 compliance uh, because you're giving people access to too much information. Uh, right, so <clears throat> what is a workspace? And how do we actually get the, the content to people? In its most simple way, you could have one workspace and do all of your dev, your testing, and your consumption in that one workspace. Is that a good idea? Who has one server for dev, testing, and deployment for SQL Server? You won't do it. So why do you do it in Power BI? We shouldn't do it. Avoid that. That's OK for a power user or a department to do their own thing, but not for the central team doing it properly. So one way to enhance this is to say, well, let's use apps. Let's take our workspace and have our workspace as dev and testing. And then we'll update the app inside the workspace and promote it to our users. Apps are a much, much nicer, more visually appealing way of consuming reports anyway. It looks nicer. It's not as techy. It's more consumable. And with that, when you create an app, it's not the same report and data set. It creates a clone of it internally inside Power BI. So you can change the workspace version. It'll have no impact on the app. Once you've finished the dev, you've tested it, you're happy with it, you can update the app, and that will take it and update the app and give it to your users. Really nice, easy way of dividing out consumption and, uh, and development stroke testing. Is it the best way? No. But it's free, because you've already got a pro license. You can, you can use that in standard pro workspaces. If you've got a premium workspace, you can go to full uh, deployment pipeline, where you can set up a workspace and say, right, I've got three workspaces. One is my dev, one is my test, one is my prod. And it will do a comparison between those workspaces and allow you um, to promote changes from one to the next as they've gone through your dev cycle, your testing cycle. So you need premium in all three workspaces. Uh, you can use premium per user. So a number of our customers have uh, premium capacity on the prod for large consumption but then dev and test the PPU to keep the costs low. And this works great because you can have different security on dev and test. So your devs can see dev, but they can't see test, or they can't change test. Only your test manager can actually promote it through into prod once it's, once it's passed. So it allows you to have that deployment uh, manageability. But it does need premium. You can actually go one stage further than this, and in your prod, turn that into an app. So what we like to do is to say, well, your prod workspace is for UAT. Give it to your end users, but a small subset of trusted power users who are going to do some testing for you as your user acceptance testing. Once they're happy with it, then you can update the app for consumption to everyone for that report. And that divides up your, um, your unit testing from a, de from a dev perspective from your UAT, from your, your customer, but your user perspective. And in that way, you can have different source data between your dev, your test, and your UAT environments, because you can configure parameters and say, right, I'm going to have the same report and data sets, but it's going to pull from a different data source in each of these environments. And the promotion will, will manage that for you. Does that make sense so far? Any questions? Quick, good question. Does the app also get promoted by the pipeline? Yes, it does. Um, apps, data sets, reports. Um, well, actually, well, sorry. The contents of the app does, but when you deploy the contents of the app uh, in, from, in, in tests, you deploy the contents, the, the data set and the report, into your prod, into UAT, and then when you click Update App, that then updates the app in that workspace. So there's two, two processes. The deployment pipeline updates the 
the actual workspace itself, and then you click update app, and that promotes it into the app itself. So it's, an, it's a manual step uh, added on to that. But all of that process can be hooked into Azure DevOps. Uh, so, question? Uh, we do have one online, but we'll have to read it out. Far away. Yep. Okay, so uh, do you know if there are any plans to have more than three environments for deployment pipelines? Any plans to uh, change the limits to deployment pipelines? I do not know, sorry. Don't know what the plans are for that. Microsoft keep the plans for things quite secret, so we tend to know when you know. Uh, but good question, don't know, sorry. Uh, go and ask Adam and Patrick on the Microsoft stand, or Chris Webb, or Casper de Jong, he's, they're there. Yeah, question. Can you use the API to publish the app? Uh, I've never tried it, but I believe you can. I believe you can automate it and hook it into the Azure DevOps pipeline to automate that even further. Yeah, good point. Right, okay, so once we've got our workspaces planned, um, we can then set up the security on the workspaces to allow people to do what they want to do. Uh, security is absolutely critical. Do not fall into the trap of allocating individual users to apps or to workspaces. It's easy, it's quick, but it's a management nightmare. When someone leaves their job and someone else replaces them, you have to go through and manually add the new person to every single workspace or app that they had access to. Use Active Directory groups, or Azure Active Directory groups. Uh, that means that once you've set up the permissions on the workspace, it's someone else's problem to manage. If you clone a user, you clone the AD groups, they clone the access to Power BI. Make sure everything is through AD groups. I cannot stress that enough. Um, Different security for dev, you, uh, dev test, and, and prod if you've got different workspaces. If you're using the workspace and app model, different groups for the workspace, different groups for the app. But critically, also think about row-level security. It's, not, it, it's OK at limiting access to a report, but what about the data inside that report? If we want to give this report to all of our sales managers, we don't want necessarily want to give them the entire uh, access to the entire data set. We can have row-level security onto our region table, for example, and give different users access to different rows in that region, uh, region table. And once we configure RLS onto that table, it propagates through all of the other tables linked to it. Very, very important when you've got a larger organization where you need to limit on a row-based uh, perspective. Rather, I see people creating 10 different reports, one per region. Just use row-level security. It works really, really, really well. You may have seen in the keynotes, they talked about sensitivity labels in Power BI. Um, they are really, really important. We use those a lot at Purple Frog. Uh, you can configure standard policies for uh, what people can do with different sensitivity labels, whether they can be exported, whether they can be emailed, whether they can be who can view them. You can't view them unless you're logged in with the right tenant, for example. Now, this is not a Power BI thing. This is an Office 365 thing. It covers Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Power BI, um, Outlook, everything. But Power BI is a critical part of that. So this is not a Power BI facility, but do put it, do raise it with your organization. We'll take questions at the end, thank you. Um, and then once you've done that, it flows into Power BI. Certifications. When you've got a data set, when people, you're trying to encourage users to reuse data sets, how do they find those data sets? They've got to search for them. Uh, they get a big list of data sets they've got access to. You need to push the important ones to the top. You do that by allocating them as certified or promoted. Anyone, any Power BI developer, can flag a data set as promoted, and that bumps it to the top of the list. Centrally, as Power BI admins, you can go one step further and mark it as certified. That's the gold standard. That will help your users find the trusted data in your environment. Next, look at monitoring. What's the point of doing all this if you're not monitoring what's going on? And that is the tricky bit in Power BI. So this is where Power BI Sentinel can come in. It can tell you, for example, you can choose a user and see across the entire tenant, every single workspace, what that user's got access to and what their permission levels are. It can show you what certifications, row-level security, sensitivity labels you've got on your entire tenant across every workspace. It can tell you across your entire workspace what data sets are failing to refresh, whether you've got access to that data set or not. It'll tell you what the errors are, so you can monitor whether people are actually fixing the problems in your estate and how quickly they're fixing it. It'll give you a heat map of through the day, midnight to midnight, when systems are refreshing 
the data sets. If you've got a problem with a premium capacity or a data source, you want to find a hotspot of what's hitting it, this is going to tell you. This is tied in with data lineage, so you can filter it by a server, a database, a, a Power BI capacity, whatever you want, and it will give you the heat map of what's being refreshed and when. There's a built-in report in Power BI called the Power BI Usage Metrics Report, which is very, very good and shows you who's using your report. Is your adoption increasing? Very useful, very good, but it only gives you one month of data. Use it, but you need to have a longer term plan than that. Sentinel will export your usage logs going back as long as you want, years, in your Azure SQL database. So you can then look at adoption over multiple years on a workspace, personal workspaces, on a user basis, anything you want. It'll give you that ability to see who's consuming your content. Are people consuming it that shouldn't be, for example? Looking at data lineage, you need to know where your data's come from and where it's going to. This is the built-in lineage view in Power BI. Go to a workspace, change the view to lineage view, and it'll give you a lovely picture of your data sources, where they're going to data sets, reports, um, and that is great, but it only works for one workspace at a time. You've got a tool like Microsoft Purview, which is the enterprise-wide governance tool for Microsoft, which does lineage very, very, very well. It is not a Power BI tool, it's a complete enterprise governance tool. Expensive and costly and time consuming to set up, but it works very, very, very well. If you want a Power BI centric solution, that's where Sentinel comes in. It will look at um, a middle ground of focusing on Power BI, but it will tell you the lineage down to individual tables as to where data is coming to and from. And it sits nicely in between the enterprise sledgehammer of Purview with the built in Power BI functionality. Uh, the final part of it is fixing. We can't really help you fix problems. What we can do is show you an audit log in Sentinel of who's changed stuff. Who's created, deleted, edited, downloaded, changed, what, when, and, and how. So you can know exactly what's gone on your environment. We've got a change tracking that shows you what's been changed between two versions. There's a backup every night or every week, so you can roll back to a backup and use that for disaster recovery. You've got tools like Christian Wade's ALM toolkit that will help you compare data, data sets to see what's been changed and selectively deploy and roll back individual changes. Really, really good tool. So to wrap up, my ask of you is to not just plow on blindly with it growing your Power BI estate. Take a step back and plan it. How do you plan your workspaces? How do you plan your security? How are you going to plan to monitor it? And how are you going to plan to make sure you are seen as the good people who can fix the problems and manage a good, well-governed estate, not get into the new version of Excel hell, which is Power BI hell. Thank you very much indeed for listening. If you have any questions, I will stop here afterwards or I'll be on the Power BI Sentinel stand. Thank you, everyone.